what better way to celebrate Valentine's Day than recording and uploading uh, video lectures about structuralism? Am I right? Right. So, uh, so with that in mind, what I what I plan to do is go over uh, or read from uh, the transcript of a written lecture, which I didn't. The substance of which I went over in class this past Tuesday, though I didn't read it, read it, read it word for word in class, and I'll be looking at some passages from our main textbook. Uh, and then at the end, I may, I'd like to go over some of the articles about Mrs. Dalloway or on Mrs. Dalloway that we, that you had to read for this past Tuesday that we also discussed at the end of class last Tuesday, especially in the context of our two methodologies of new criticism and structuralism. Uh, it can be really tricky to distinguish between the two of these, and many of you in a few of the response papers I got to these articles, uh, and just in conversation in class, many of us realized that it, if, if a work of structuralism, structuralist literary study is dedicated to just a single work of literature, as opposed to many works of literature, and I'll talk about this in just a few minutes, it can be really difficult to distinguish between a new critical and a structuralist reading. Okay, so that, that's one thing that I hope to develop for us uh, in this lecture and, and really through the remainder of the semester, the distinctions between the attitudes of new criticism, structuralism, and deconstruction um, will be pretty important for all of us. Deconstruction, which will be coming up, which is coming up next week. Um, goody <laughs> for all of us, all right. So before I just keep rambling for another 10 minutes, something most of you have gotten used to already, I think, uh, I just want to begin. Okay. So, Structuralist Criticism and Poetics is the title of this, chap of this chapter of this lecture. The transition from new criticism to structuralism can be a bit confusing. The other name I've been using for structuralism, that is, formalism, resembles structuralism so closely, especially since Cleanth Brooks actually uses the word structure over and over again in his close readings of individual poems, as well as in his uh, more theoretical writings about what literary criticism should be giving an account of what it, when it interprets individual works of literature. And so if you need a refresher on that, it might be a good idea to go back and look at the video lectures from week one. Regardless of this resemblance uh, between formalism and structuralism, and regardless of certain affinities between formalism and structuralism, there are some pretty key differences, many of them theoretical rather than practical in nature. And what do I mean by this? Mainly that new critics did not really develop a systematic theory of, despite despite my claim in my first video videos that Cleanth Brooks uh, was for me so surprisingly theoretical in, in some of his writings, new criticism did not really develop a systematic theory of literature um, at all. Though many of them did attempt to give accounts of poetry or literature in general, they were rarely informed, at least directly, by the centuries of aesthetic theory that predated them. Thus, they were a kind of odd mixture of empiricism, a school of philosophy predicated upon trusting only those facts gathered by our senses, by our direct contact with the world around us, and a romanticism, generally a belief in the transcend transcendent power of art or literature, poetry specifically. There is a bit of cognitive dissonance, in other words, in some new critics, insofar as they want to formalize and standardize the study of literature so that it is a set of investigations about what is in the poems themselves. That's the empirical side of it. All the while retaining a notion, as we saw in Cleanth Brooks, that poetry has some sort of essential and vital nature that really escapes sort of an empirical account. Poems are, for Brooks, you will remember, alive. And we cannot be alive 
to them unless we attune ourselves to the paradoxical and ironical modes of expression inherent in them. They are able to express things, feelings, and ideas that are inexpressible in ordinary expository uses of language. This privileging of literature by the new critics seems to cut against the principles of a more empirical approach to literary study, the kind of approach that they purportedly wanted to standardize. The influence of structuralism on literary studies marks a movement away from this admixture of empiricism and romanticism. Structuralist literary study retains an interest in something called structure or form, but is generally less interested in the unique aspects of particular works of literature and more interested in the grammar or poetics, the set of codes and conventions that structure our perception of something as literature from the get-go, as well as our expectations of what should or should not be found in literary works. If this does not make sense yet, that's okay. We'll come back around to these ideas. The shift from new criticism to structuralism, so the shift, uh, new criticism, which kind of you know, it's hard to date, but 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, and then trickling into the latter decades of the 20th century, structuralism, which we can kind of date around the 70s in some sense, at least in the United States, though a great deal of French structuralism uh, is uh, being pursued, or what we would call as structuralist, structuralist kinds of approaches to a variety of um, uh, subjects, objects, and topics is going on in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, especially in France. Um, this shift from new criticism to structuralism, the 30s, 40s, 50s, into the 60s and 70s, at least in, in the United States, was really sparked by the reception of the Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure's Course in General Linguistics, which was not really a book, but uh, a compilation of students' notes on his lectures. But what does linguistics, as the study or theory of language, have to do with how one might go about the study of literature? Or we might say, how does Saussurean linguistics specifically have to do with the study of literature? Is it simply that literature is an example of language, and so that what Saussure says about language in general must somehow be beneficial to studying literature? We'll have to come back to these questions. So Sir's theory and approach to the study of language is predicated upon a series of important distinctions and premises. Uh, in, this, in the description below this video, I'm going to link you to um, a video about Saussure so that I posted last semester for, for a different class on postmodern literature in which we read Jacques Derrida's uh, Of Grammatology. Uh, and Saussure so is one of the main one of the main uh, antagonists, let's say, uh, in that book. And so I have a video that it, that I put, posted last semester that is really just sort of doing what I'm going to do in this video. So if you'd like to double up on uh, and see what I said about Saussure back then, um, click the link below and you can go watch that before watching the rest of this one. Anyway, Parker covers the, the distinctions that are important to Saussure and Saussure's main uh, premises on pages 45 to 52 in our, our primary textbook, and also on page 59, which I, I don't think I did assign. But I want to cover them in a somewhat different order than he does in this video. In a sense, it is less important to develop a robust theoretical understanding of each of Saussure's concepts than it is to understand the, uh, the ethos or the kind of attitude or point of view that Saussure is developing toward his object of study. It is Saussure's point of view, I argue, and its implications for how one approaches an object that will be most influential on literary studies, and that is still very influential on literary studies. The first distinction between, uh, and these are, these are uh, French terms, langue and parole. Langue and parole, or parole. 
these concepts can be translated pretty simply into language and utterance. Okay. The first, lang, denotes the overall system of language, including its rules of grammar and usage. The second, uh, parole, denotes instances of language use, right? specific uses of language. So we might say French is an example of langue, right? Do you know French? Do you speak French? Are you fluent in French? Right, because what we're referring to is a, a language that has its own lexicon, grammar, codes, and conventions of usage, and not and and competing codes and conventions of usage depending on uh, what culture or what you know district within a particular um, a national culture one is currently inhabiting. So that's that would be French. That's langue versus um, a poem or a novel or a greeting in French, right? Uh, salut, bonjour, ça va? Right, these would be instances of parole, right? Uh, specific utterances. So Sir argues that linguists should not so much concern themselves with the interpretation of particular utterances, but should instead concern themselves with the systematic study of langue, of language itself. To illustrate the difference between lang and parole, um, Saussure so and others often use the example of a game. Like if we wanted to study a game, right? Any game, a game of chess, for instance. Though games are not languages, uh, though perhaps they are in a meta maybe a metaphorical sense, the difference between the set of rules in a game, the codes and conventions according to which one structures one's approach to playing the game, versus particular moves or turns in an actual game being played is analogous to the difference between the larger system of language, right, its rules, codes, conventions, grammars, etc., and individual uses of language in speech, writing, etc. So Sir also wanted to get out of the history of language business, at least in the course in general linguistics, usually pursued in the field of philology. He thought that focusing on changes in vocabulary and definition, excuse me, across the centuries and between different languages, stymied our ability to develop a rigorous theory of language in general. A theory that might be generalizable to other languages as well, both present and past. And so we get a second distinction, right? And this is on page 59 from Parker's book, which you did not read, between synchronic and diachronic investigation. Synchronic study refers to the isolation of a language from its development or history. It is concerned with how a language is used at a particular time. Diachronic study would be concerned with the development of a language. Well, not just a language, but really anything. With its history, its shifts in rules, and the story of the standardization of certain norms, codes, and conventions. In order to understand the difference between these, the game analogy is once again useful. Say we are studying the rules, codes, and conventions of how to play chess. That was my example before. A structuralist would bracket out any concern with the study of how chess came to be played the way it is, right? Were there, were there always kings and queens and rooks and knights and pawns and bishops, right, or, uh, or what, right? Um, and what is the history of how certain ways of moving were um, assigned to each of these pieces, right? A structuralist wouldn't care about those questions, or m might be curious, but in, in the actual study of the game um, would not necessarily be investigating those questions. Instead, they would be concerned strictly with how chess is played right now or at some determined point or span of time in the past. So we have long and parole, synchronic and diachronic investigation. So Sir prefers lang, a focus on lang or language, um, and, he, and he wants to um, also bracket out the concerns with the development or history of that language and, fo and pursue a synchronic study of that language. Sorry, I was just looking at the time here. 
So, so, sir, um, instead of defining linguistics as, um, oh, wait, excuse me. This happens sometimes. Oh, yeah, sorry. So we have long and parole. We have synchronic and diachronic investigation. Now it's time to make sense of the oddest set of terms, which, though not directly applicable to literature, again help to fashion an attitude or point of view for a new approach to such study. So, so, sir, instead of defining linguistics as the study of words, right, that have a sort of set of ready-made definitions, Sisser claims that linguistics should be, or is, the study of signs and the governing rules and relations that regulate the usage and meaning of signs. How and in what way does a sign manage to signify something? That is, how and in what ways does it manage to mean something to competent users of a language? This is where it gets tricky, <laughs> because Saussure invents an anatomy of the sign. And I don't know why this was anatomy, who knows. Uh, invents an anatomy of the sign. It is made of two inseparable, yet distinct components, the signifier and the signified. We can roughly define these two components, or at least Jonathan Culler does, as form and meaning. By form, we mean what's, what's the vehicle by which the sign is sort of um, circulated and distributed. So if we're talking about speech um, and want to use a particular sign as, as an example, we would say that the sound k at, right? When you put it together into the sound cat, right? That's the signifier. The sound k at, right? Would be a signifier since it is the form, the sonic form of our word cat, right? Our word cat. The meaning or sense or significance that we associate with this sound, ka-at, is the signified. As Parker puts it on page 47, so Sir saw a firm link between the signifier, our example, ka-at, and the signified, our, our concept of cat that we attach to that sound. So that any given sign is not merely the concept it represents, the signified, or its representation or form, the signifier, but the two bonded together, like two sides of a coin or a piece of paper. This should make some sort of sense to us, right? So that was Parker. This is me. <laughs> this should make some sort of sense to us, since when I use, when I, uh, excuse me, when I use the sound ka'at, None of you are confused, right? When you hear the sound cat, if you're competent English users, you're not confused, right? You may, may not be imagining a specific cat. If you have a cat or you think I have a cat or you saw a cat out a window, you might not be imagining a specific cat in the world. But you are ready because you are, again, competent English users to make sense of whatever sentence I might put together concerning a cat. As difficult as it may be to understand this two-part anatomy of signs, it is important if only because of the two following principles that Saussure associates with signs. First, though the signifier and signified are inseparable in a particular sign, in a particular instance of parole, within the governing system of a particular lung, the relationship between signifier and signified is arbitrary. There is no natural, logical, or essential relationship between them. Even though we cannot separate them, right, even as competent English users, there is a kind of necessary bond between the sound ka'at and the meaning we associate with it, right? Even though there's a kind of a set necessary link between them that we can't just decide to break apart, so Sir says that necessary relationship is still not essential, logical, or natural. There is no reason other than 
accident and history and contingency for why the sound cat corresponds to our concept cat. None at all. For a structuralist, the signifier and signified are simply and irrevocably sutured together into the sign cat. Later structuralists will make a great deal of this principle of arbitrariness. But if the relation between signifier and signified is arbitrary, what guarantees that I will know what someone means when they use the sign cat? Saussure's answer is a bit weird, excuse me, but incredibly important. Um, and instead of me trying, trying to describe it, although I do in the, the video I linked to below, um, let's look at how Parker deals with this, right? So the first principle is the principle of arbitrariness. The second principle uh, is just as important. So turn to page 48, because I want to read, read uh, um, maybe a couple pages of this, okay? I completely forgot cat was his example. Okay, so uh, on page 48, he says, we only recognize a signifier such as cat, so sir continued, by processing its by processing almost unconsciously, right? Or, or unconsciously. It's difference from other potentially similar signifiers. We recognize the word cat because it differs from bat and cut and cab and so on. Not because it has an inherent connection to the particular signified that convention has attached to it. Each language has a limited set of sounds which linguists call phonemes, that its speakers, people who know its long, hear as marking meaningful differences. English has about 40 phonemes, linguists tell us, varying with the speaker and dialect, but speakers of English have grown so accustomed to those phonemes that they are not conscious of them. It would have worked out differently, such that we did not hear a meaningful difference between the sound cat and the sound cut, or between cat and cad or kit. We apprehend the difference between signifiers, then, by a conventional distribution of phonemes that could have turned out differently, and that to some extent has, has turned out differently in different versions of English. Some English speakers, such as Shakespearean actors, roll an R sound. But that causes no confusion because we recognize two notably different sounds, the rolled and the unrolled R, as the same phoneme, as R sounds, in other words. But in another language, such as Spanish, they could represent different phonemes, making a word with a rolled R signify something different from an otherwise identical sound without a rolled R. So let's keep, let's keep reading, okay? Writing, so Sir notes, works the same way. Two people may not write this, the letter R exactly the same way, but if we recognize it as the letter R, then they both write it within the range of possibilities that readers of English conventionally recognize as signifying the same concept. The writing system could have been constructed differently, such that the differing ways that two different people write R could have signified two different letters. We thus come to recognize signifiers, this is the important bit, not because of an inherent quality within them. Think about new criticism for a second, right? We thus come to recognize signifiers, not be, like the sound cat, not because of an inherent quality within that sound, within the signifier, but by their position in a system of differences from other signifiers. We recognize immediately the sound cat, not because of something inherent to it, not because it alone in isolation is somehow special, but because it exists already within a much larger system of sound compositions from which it differs. Okay. To so sir then, I'll just read the next short paragraph. To so sir then, difference a system of comparisons and relations produces meaning. 
meaning is not inherent to the sign, not inherent to the signifier, right? Meaning is not inherent to the signifier. That's the exact ne next question, right? On the contrary, it comes from an arbitrary system of conventions that distributes the differences among signifiers. In language for Saussure, and he's quoting Saussure here, there are only differences, so that language is a form and not a substance. Okay. All right. Um, so to sum up, and I, I might pause here and begin begin the next video. So Sir, uh, so Sir emphasizes long over parole, synchrony or synchronic study over diachronic study. He emphasizes signs rather than words, distinctions between signifiers, which are made up of phonemes, and signifieds, which it's probably better to call our concepts that are attached to those si signifiers. He develops the principles of arbitrariness, right? That the relationship between signifier and signified between form and concept is arbitrary. There's no natural relationship between the two. And that the difference, and that the difference between a signifier and all other signifieds within a ready-made but volatile network of differences, right? That it is that difference from other signifieds that produces the meaning, to, the meaning to which that signifier is attached. What on earth does any of this have to do with literature? In the next video, um, I'll begin to directly address that question.